Hi, my name is Alexandra, and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to a lovely jaunt where we read better, not more. Today I'm filming with my window open because our air conditioning doesn't work and there's a nice breeze, so you guys may hear some additional background sounds. We're gonna roll with it. So today we are still talking about the Iliad, yes, because it's still amazing. If you've missed any of the videos, I have a whole playlist dedicated to what we've covered, um, and I'll be sure to link that down below, and you may see some cards pop up where relevant in the upper part of the screen as well. So, so far we've covered the mythology, the history, the poetry, and we've talked about Achilles and Agamemnon. Today we are talking about the Trojan's greatest hero, Hector. So Homer does something profoundly interesting with the only Trojan hero who can challenge the strength of the Greeks. He makes him our favorite. Hector is literally everyone's favorite. So the narrative makes it very clear that Hector is a powerful warrior. When he and Ajax fight, it's a standoff, um, and Hector can only be bested by Achilles and he's doomed to be bested by Achilles. And we know this, so why does Homer take so much time to make him so empathetic? Why would you do this to us? Well, because it's great storytelling. It has always been great storytelling to kill off your darlings. So let's kind of dig into how Homer constructs and, and leads us to this empathetic view of Hector. Well, yes, he's excellent in fighting, but he also doesn't relish it. He doesn't have bloodlust, and more than once he actually runs from a fight. He often expresses that he doesn't really want to face the fight, but feels the duty to do so. Who else will defend his city if he doesn't? Paris? Also, the setting. So this came up when I talked about the epic similes um, in episode three about poetry. The epic similes give us a glimpse into the peaceful life of the Greeks, but it's very abstract. At Troy, it's very concrete. We get a couple of scenes inside the city with Priam and the other major players, but the longest one focuses on Hector. These scenes are so powerful and iconic, I'd really like to take a look, closer look at them. In book six, Hector is getting ready to fight. He also visits his brother and sort of like rounds him up like, hey, it's time to get out there, right? Because he's in the bedroom with Helen. Who knew? But as you can imagine, Helen is not super popular with the Trojans, even though she's living there, right? But just imagine it. She's caused this huge war that otherwise this city would be at peace. And what loyalty do the normal people have to her who are out there defending the wall of the city? They don't really owe her anything. She's this foreign princess, right? So yeah, not super popular in the city. But she says, Hector has always been kind to her and treated, with digni treated her with dignity. Not only that, but we get to see Hector with his own family. He finds his wife on the wall of the city with their young son, and she tells him how she's worried about the outcome of the war. If he dies on the battlefield, she will mourn, but it also seals the death of her son and her own capture as a slave, likely as a concubine. Here's what Hector replies. All these things are in my mind also, lady, yet I would feel deep shame before the Trojan and the Trojan women with trailing garments if I were to shrink aside from the fighting. For I know this thing in my heart, and my mind knows it. There will come a day when sacred Ilion shall perish, and Priam, and the people of Priam of the strong ash spear. But it is not so much the pain to come of the Trojans that troubles me, not even of Priam the king, nor Hecabe, nor the thought of my brothers, as the thought of you when some bronze-armored Achaean leads you off, taking away your day of liberty in tears. So yes, Hector has some traditional views of shame and glory before men. He s clearly states not only here but elsewhere but he's, that he's often motivated by this fear of shame. But he's also motivated to protect his wife. It, he even says, even more so than just the general sense that he needs to protect his people, even more so than the fear he feels for his own father Priam and his mother Hecabe, even more so than the fear he feels for his brothers, is the tragedy that he feels for his wife. And if that's not enough to wrench your guts out, check out this scene. So speaking, glorious Hector held out his arms to his baby, who shrank back to his fair girdled nurse's bosom, screaming and frightened at the aspect of his own father, terrified as he saw the crest with its horsehair, nodding dreadfully as he thought from the peak of his helmet. 
So his son sees a soldier in armor, not his father, and this aspect is terrifying to him. It's almost like a flash forward of the terror his son will face when the Greeks eventually take the city and storm about raining destruction. Hector is empathetic because we are no longer talking about the pastoral life in a very abstract way through epic similes, but very concretely with real characters who are going to pay the consequences of this war. And finally, we have Hector as the son. By the time Priam comes to beg for the body of Hector, Achilles has not only killed Hector, but several other of Priam's sons, which he has quite a few. We see how Hector was chief among them, the noblest leader, the best of the Trojans. We see his father, who sees his reign of his city come to an end, and knows that Hector was going to be the next great king, but no longer. Before I close out this video, there's one more aspect to Hector's character that I want to take a look at, and it doesn't have anything to do necessarily with him being empathetic, but I think it sort of counterbalances him from being too perfect of a character. And it's that Hector might be a braggart. He might be more talk than action. Now, a lot of people don't talk about this aspect to his character, so I'd be curious to see if you find other examples of it when you're reading. So make sure to put them in the comments. One example I wanna talk, there's actually two. So in book seven, Ajax is doing some serious killing when Hector sees him right around line 215, and he wants to shrink back into like the cover of his men so he doesn't go get noticed, but Ajax calls him out, they toss back and forth some speeches, and then they get into the battle, which is casting of spears from some distance. Hector fails two spear throws in a row, and Ajax has two successes in a row. So it really gets at that idea that even though there's no doubt that Hector is a very capable warrior, that he may not be quite up to his reputation among the Greeks, that the Greeks fear him more than is he's worthy of fear. This is duplicated again when Achilles finally comes out to fight Hector, and Hector literally runs away so hard, I think he laps the city of Troy seven times or something like that, and finally the gods have to stop him and hold him in place for the fight. Of course Hector knows that he's doomed to die in this fight, or he has some sense of it, it's not like it's prophesied or anything, it's just that he knows that Achilles is the better fighter than he is. So. In one sense, it's like, well, it's kind of reasonable to run away from the person that you know is better than you, and you're probably gonna die and follow the city, blah, blah, blah. But it does speak to that inner part of him that just has takes no joy in fighting, that has no joy in it, and who seems to be primarily motivated because he knows it would be shameful for him not to. So that's all I have for you today. Let me know what you think of the character of Hector. Why do you think it's so important for the narrative to construct him with this empathetic view? So we get this really intimate view of him in his family. And do you think that there's any merit in my counterposition as well, that Hector may be more talk than fight, a little bit of a braggart? Can you find other examples of that? Comment down below. I want to discuss this more with you in the comments. Until next time, I'm Alexandra, and I'm still a bibliophile. Mm -hmm.